Uh, if you are all ready to, to, to start, uh, maybe we can start. My name is Rémi Parmentier. I'm going to be your facilitator today at this session, which is called uh, the uh, Low Hanging Fish from New York UN Ocean Conference to Buenos Aires MC11. Will the uh, WTO deliver on SDG target 14.6? Uh, um, why did we call this, uh, uh, this session the low hanging fish? It is with reference to a report that we have just published a few days ago. When I say we, it is Bloom, the uh, uh, NGO uh, which is very active on the issue of sustainable fishing uh, in the European Union and beyond, and whose CEO, uh, Claire Nouvian, is here and uh, the Varda Group, the organization that uh, uh, I, I am uh, running. Uh, we have published this uh, uh, report uh, which is in which we uh, review and comment on the seven proposals that are on the table at the moment uh, on the issue of, of uh, uh, sustainable uh, fisheries and the elimination of harmful fishery subsidies in preparation for MC11. Uh, and as I, I suppose you all know, this uh, um, discussion, uh, which uh, goes back a very long time, has been uh, um, encouraged and uh, speeded up in the last couple of years since the uh, UN General Assembly adopted the uh, UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals and concretely SDG point uh, uh, SDG 14.6, which has a target for the elimination of harmful fishery subsidies uh, by 2020. So uh, there is no time to waste, and we wait, welcome the fact that uh, the uh, WTO has uh, uh, been very active in accordance to the uh, 2017 annual report of the WTO. Uh, Last year, and I quote, last year, the work of the Rules Committee was dominated by the issue of, uh, of harmful uh, fisheries subsidies. Uh, you may know, uh, or I suppose you know, that uh, uh, some 10 days ago, the UN uh, Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, uh, appointed a uh, high-level uh, uh, special envoy for the ocean. Uh, he appointed the former uh, chairman of the uh, General Assembly, Peter Thompson from Fiji. And uh, Peter Thompson, you can see in our report, uh, uh, says very clearly that eliminating harmful fishery subsidies is key to our remedial efforts and to meeting the universally agreed targets of SDG 14. Um, more recently, uh, today, uh, we had a conversation this morning, Claire and I, with uh, the WTO uh, Director General, Roberto uh, Azevedo, as you can see on this photo, where we uh, thought it was proper to introduce to him uh, our report, the low uh, hanging fish, uh, before we would uh, make it public. So we had that conversation, that meeting this morning, and indeed, I think it was very productive and and, and we could see that uh, the uh, Director General of, of the WTO, uh, I don't know if he would use the expression, but uh, he uh, certainly uh, sees the uh, issue of uh, fishery subsidies as a low-hanging fish or uh, a low-hanging uh, fruit, if you prefer, for the uh, ministerial conference in, in Buenos Aires. So as I mentioned, we have Claire Nouvian with us. She is the uh, CEO of Bloom in France. She's very well known in France and in Brussels as the uh, overfishing terminator. And uh, she's going to uh, explain uh, why uh, the elimination of fishery subsidies uh, is, in her opinion and in our opinion, the cornerstone for a healthy ocean. That will be followed by Christophe Bellman, which uh, many people in this room uh, uh, know very well. He's with ICTSD, he's based here in Geneva. And he will uh, comment on how low uh, is uh, the hanging fish uh, 
uh, in, before uh, Buenos Aires, and we are privileged and we have the honor to have, uh, after these presentations, uh, commentaries from, the, from Ambassador Juan Carlos Gonzalez uh, from uh, Colombia, from Ambassador uh, David Walker from New Zealand, a country that has been uh, uh, very, very active in the last two decades on this issue, and Councillor uh, Mustakim uh, de Gama from South Africa, who will uh, give us his uh, uh, perspective uh, from his continent, uh, Africa. And we uh, wish to uh, um, make sure that you all have an opportunity for uh, uh, asking questions or making comments from the floor. So uh, with no uh, further delay, I'm asking every speaker uh, to speak for uh, no more than 10 minutes uh, in order uh, to go through the program, because we've got to be out of here at uh, 5 o'clock. So Claire. Good afternoon, everyone. Very happy to be here to talk about a, a subject which is dear to my heart, uh, which is uh, fishery subsidies. So um, about a week ago in this room, uh, ICTSD held a seminar, uh, which was a knowledge sharing seminar on fishery subsidies, which uh, had some very important components that I think we should be sharing with you as a reminder. Um, the first, this is my first slide. So going back to basic economics, on this slide, you can see that uh, you've got fishing effort down, you've got catch on the left-hand side. When there is no fishing effort deployed to, to catch fish, you've got no catch, you have no revenue, right? That makes sense. And then you deploy fishing effort. And the more you deploy it, the more you go into overfishing. And so if there is too much fishing effort deployed, there is no more fishing activity, there is no more fishing sector, and this is the trend that, and the dangerous slope that we are on as a global community. We are overfishing because we have overcapacity. At the end of the day, this will end with um, d the demise of the fishing sector itself because there is very few activities which rely on the environment like the fishing sector does. It is the last big large-scale activity which relies entirely on a wild resource and this should never be forgotten. So this is what happens with um, a, a, a resource which, is, um, which has open access. So you've got an equilibrium where basically you, have, you do have quite naturally an overcapitalized fishing activity and uh, you know, economic activity. So this is what we call open access equilibrium. It goes a bit beyond what we should be doing, which means we have very high costs and we have an equilibrium which is already on a downward trend when you look at the fish biomass. So the captures go down a bit and the costs are pretty high, but that's where the natural equilibrium should be. Where, what we should be aiming for is the maximized captures, that's called MSY, maximum sustainable yield. That's where it's, you've got the biggest amount of fish for a certain amount of costs uh, implicated. Economists tell you that the maximized rent is actually what we call uh, maximum economic yield, and that's where you should leave some fish in the water, because that's where you've got the biggest catch possible. You don't have to spend that much money to have the biggest catch possible. So that's a bit below MSY, and it's called MEY, so it's maximum economic yield as opposed to maximum sustainable yield. But what we're, in, we're here today for is to talk about subsidies. And what subsidies do is that they create an artificial condition, so they change your economic patterns. And what they do is that they encourage, they create a financial incentive to overfish. They actually reduce costs of the fishing industry, therefore you can overcapitalize even more your fishing industry. And the more subsidies you put in, and the more you're, you're targeting and, and coming close to this a very dark scenario by which there is very, very little fish biomass to fish. So at the end of the day, when you have less fish, you have less food security, you have less jobs, you have more public expenditures, less economic viability, and you do have a very high degradation of the environment, less productivity in the environment, and less resilience, which actually counts in the face of climate change. And that's an, another important factor that we have to weave in. Scientists, economists, they all know that basically with the fishing activity and the fishing sector on, uh, globally will come um, the, in the short run. It is overfishing. It is fishing overcapacity, which is putting the biggest stress on the natural resource and eventually um, translate into economic losses. But we do have to think in the long run, if we don't, even if we got our act together, 
On the economic side of the, f the management and the disciplines that we should, uh, we should be adopting for the management of the fishing sector globally, there is climate change coming our way. And climate change, when you look at um, all the different aspects, salinity, pH changes in the water, oxygen levels, circulation patterns that are going to change, they are going to lead to a big change in the productivity of the ocean and where the productivity will be and what it will lead to. And what we'll see is that we'll have very few winners, because the trend is that 80% um, of fishing nations worldwide are going to lose captures. They're going to lose catch. And the, the trend is that, of course, because of uh, temperatures and other factors, the fish are going, moving towards polar areas. So um, areas like Greenland would see under this scenario, which is, um, which is a high emission IPCC scenario. So it's like business as usual. Let's imagine we d we're not able to really tackle climate change the way we should be. This is what would happen by 2050, by the, the middle of the 21st century. Greenland, for example, would have its economic zone gained 58% of catch, more fish catch in this scenario. But the tropics are the biggest losers. They would lose 38% of catch if nothing actually changes with, um, you know, with our business as usual IPCC scenario. So you would, we do have to take this into consideration because this is going to be putting a lot of additional stress on the fishing sector. So subsidies favor large-scale fleets over small-scale fleets. I think Christoph will talk about this a little bit, but roughly 80% of subsidies worldwide are given to large-scale fleets over small-scale fleets. So other um, important additional facts that we should look at, all subsidies, and that was a takeaway lesson that we, should, uh, we, we could remember from the OECD uh, speaker last week, all subsidies eventually can lead to overcapacity and overfishing. If you want to help your fishermen, then you really should think of direct aid going to fishers based on income. Two, and it was really important, the, the OECD speaker and economist was telling us, um, once you've got you know, harmful subsidies given away, once you've got those policies in place, it's very hard to reform them for many reasons, including the pressure that the fishing industry is going to exert on policymakers and fisheries managers. So if you do have WTO global dis disciplines, you should not uh, underestimate how useful it's going to be for um, national managers, for national governments to actually have an excuse to reform their national policies and reap the domestic fruit of global change. Fisheries management is not um, in your negotiating mandate as WTO negotiators, and that was a very important lesson. It's very difficult when you go into the fisheries management um, of you know fishing sector, it becomes very complex and so on. So really what the WTO should do is to focus on, on endorsing and adopting robust um, a rationale, um, you know, based on economic rationale, so you have strong disciplines that help the global community to accomplish much in terms of sustainability of fish stocks and eventually economic viability, which is really what we want. Lessons for the WTO. A straight, straightforward, clear, maintaining the financial incentive, which is the slides that I've shown, for fishers to fish beyond economic reason, to fish towards ecological degradation, does not benefit anyone. This is really straightforward. And whether you want to encourage large scale over small scale or whatever is really your prerogative in, in terms of sovereign uh, prerogative, so this is not stepping on your toes in any other way. So prohibiting subsidies that encourage overcapacity and overfishing, overfishing sorry, would really help fix the situation that globally really got out of hands. So we need to create the conditions for sustainable fishing. A net win for all would mean eliminating construction subsidies and other support subsidies that actually are go to fixed inputs, i.e. vessels, uh, fleet, uh, fishing fleets, because they do create fishing capacity in excess. So we have overcapacity, which is a huge problem, which needs to be dealt with at some point. And the sooner, the better, in, you know, keeping in mind the climate change scenarios that are, we, that is, are, that are looming over our heads. We need to eliminate fuel subsidies and other subsidies that actually support variable inputs like bait and so on, because they create an incentive to overfish and to lead to unviable fishing operations. Adopting transparency, this is a very high uh, topic on our agenda for civil society because we know that it's very difficult to manage anything 
in equilibrium for the best rationale and the, the, the biggest equality in society if you don't have the data. So make sure that the WTO does adopt transparency and puts it very high on its, on its negotiating agenda. And of course, release funds, because we're not against subsidies at all. 60% of subsidies worldwide are, are, are deemed to be harmful, but you, there are many subsidies that need to be given out there for positive, um, for positive uh, activities. Um, we need, we can you know, in, increase data collection, monitoring and surveillance, which is gonna be very helpful to fight IUU, illegal fishing, management, infrastructure, and so on. So, MC11, of course, is a tipping point. We all know that we can no longer wait, and the world is looking at the WTO right now to do the good thing and to put things in order, because if the economic reality of the fishing sector is that it is encouraged to overfish, that the overcapacity is kept afloat thanks to this artificial factor, which is uh, public subsidies, we're not gonna be able to do the job. We're not gonna be able to save the fish and fishermen. So status quo is a lose-lose scenario for all. What do you risk in trying? You risk nothing. What do you risk in not changing? Then you risk to re you really risk losing everything. So um, to uh, paraphrase uh, Oscar Wilde, reach for the sky because your only risk is to land in stars. Thank you. Thank you, um, Claire. Um, I'm sure that uh, your uh, your uh, passionate. Uh, uh, presentation will raise a lot of questions. So, uh, with no uh, further delay, I'll pass on to to Christophe, so that we are sure to have time to 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 have a discussion with the with all of you uh, after the presentation. So, uh, Christophe from ICTSD, go ahead. How uh, are you? How positive are you with this uh, <laughs> this discussion, which you follow so closely? <laughs> Well, th thank you, and, and thanks for the invitation. And, and, and maybe uh, before I answer that question, let me just make a few, a few, a few uh, uh, disclaimer. Uh, you know, I've been working with uh, with uh, with this, some countries, including some uh, LDCs, and in the past with uh, ACP countries. Just want to make sure that this is not the views of any country. <laughs> These are all my only my my personal kind of assessment of uh, 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 where we are and 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 what we need to do. Uh, Maybe, you know, thinking about catching the, the low-hanging fish, uh, maybe let me start with some general kind of uh, uh, consideration. I think obviously if we want an agreement, we'll have at some point to, to calibrate the, the, the scope of the disciplines uh, with the, the chances of getting an, an agreement at some point. And, and when I say that, I don't mean that the lower the level of ambition, the, the easier uh, to, we get an, an agreement. I think to the contrary that, for example, an agreement that would only focus on transparency would probably not gather enough enough support. Uh, so, so we need a certain level of of of, uh, of, of, uh, of ambition, a, a sufficiently large scope. Uh, it's more a kind of uh, inverted U shape <laughs> type of approach, and we need to get to that uh, to that uh, to optimum uh, optimum level uh, where we can combine you know scope and 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 and, and percentage or ch chances of achieving an, a, a good outcome. Second, we need to uh, respond to the mandates, including uh, the WTO mandate and SDG 14 mandate. Uh, and it has different elements. I think, uh, for example, in a, an outcome that would focus only on subsidies to IUU in this respect would not meet uh, that particular requirement. Third, I think there's a recognition that we will need to have some form of special and differential treatment in those negotiations. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, major exemptions and so on and so forth. It can be technical assistance, it can be longer transition period, uh, but obviously uh, uh, we'll need to have that in the, in the, in the, in the, in the package. Uh, finally, obviously, the, the, the wider the scope, uh, the, the larger the pressure will be to have some sort of uh, uh, exceptions, uh, exemptions, including but not limited to, uh, to, uh, to, to special and differential treatment. And here again, we'll have to find the right balance between the scope of disciplines and, and the need for, uh, for uh, uh, um, exceptions and special and differential treatment. Now, with this in mind, what I thought I would do is maybe review some of the areas where I think uh, consensus still uh, has been elusive and that would need to be addressed if we want to have a, an, an agreement. The first area is, of course, uh, um, subsidies to uh, uh, IUU. 
uh, and the prohibition to uh, we shouldn't be subsidizing uh, illegal, unreported, and un unregulated fishing. That sounds like a fairly straightforward, relatively uncontroversial uh, uh, objective. But as always, the, I think the devil is in the detail. Uh, first issue is, of course, the definition. We have the uh, FAO uh, uh, International Plan of Action that uh, provides some guidance. It's an internationally agreed agreement, but it's not an exhaustive, it's not a definition. It's basically a non-exhaustive description of what is included under IUU. Uh, the other option we have is a national uh, definitions or uh, uh, definitions from RFMOs, uh, which are usually based on the, on the IPOA, but they can differ from you know, one country to the, uh, to the other. Uh, some elements of the IUU are more complicated than others. The I is relatively uncontroversial. Some of the U might be a bit more problematic, and particularly unregulated uh, uh, fishing. What if a government doesn't uh, maybe have the capacity to regulate fishery, uh, fisheries in all its territory? In other words, should fishermen be blamed or held accountable for a lack of action by, by government? Uh, Second uh, aspect, I think uh, we need to agree on who is uh, going to identify this IUU. Is it the flag state uh, who finds that one of his vessels is engaged in the IUU? Is it the subsidizing government? Is it the coastal state? Uh, if uh, some uh, foreign boat is fishing in my EUZ, <laughs> Uh, can I uh, 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 make sure that uh, this uh, illegally, can I make sure that some action is taken? Um, we have, of course, also the list of the RFMOs. The problems we have here is that those lists are usually very small, uh, essentially limited to non-parties basically because parties of the RFMOs have other ways of dealing with those issues. Uh, and if, if one RFMO is listing one of my boats as having been engaged in IUU, what kind of uh, ways I have to ensure that it's not an arbitrary decision, so issues around uh, due process become uh, obviously an issue. And finally, issues of disputed waters uh, uh, is uh, something that has to be uh, addressed. A second area is uh, subsidies that would target overfish stocks. Um, that's also an area where you would think, well, you know, that should be relatively straightforward. We shouldn't be subsidizing uh, vessels that target fish uh, stocks that are already in an overfish conditions. But here again, there are a number of issues that arise. Uh, and first, who and how do you define what's in, what is an overfished uh, stocks? Do you have an objective definition or do you rely on the different national uh, uh, definitions and authorities? Uh, and what you see, which is the, 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 the first arrow on the, on the right, is that actually what you, when you look in practice, different countries have different ways of and methodology to declare that a stock is overfished. And that varies from one country to the other. Um, another issue is what about unassessed stocks? Uh, we know that uh, today uh, the assessments that we have roughly correspond to 70% of global catches. Uh, and these include the main commercial species. But what about unass unassessed stocks? Should we just uh, assume based on the precautionary principle that you shouldn't be subsidizing those at the risk of maybe targeting in particular fisheries that are relevant to small artisanal fisheries where it is not economically uh, interesting, it doesn't make sense economically to spend a lot of money in, in doing assessments. Uh, finally, uh, what should be a proper uh, stock assessment? There are very different ways of doing that. If going from very scientific surveys, that's what you have on the, on the arrow on the, on, the, on the right, the second arrow. It can go from very scientific surveys to uh, 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 local surveys by asking people uh, 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 what they catch and so on and so forth. So what is, uh, what would constitute a, a good stock assessment? What about uh, fisheries which are multi-species, which is the case in most uh, uh, developing countries where you're not targeting one species in particular, but you're targeting a whole series of species. Uh, how do you go about uh, uh, these, these situations? Uh, third, um, subsidies to overfishing and overcapacity. And here I think uh, the big problem or the issue that members would have to, to resolve is 
uh, how do you, uh, basically we're, here we're dealing with an ex-ante description of certain forms of subsidies where we would decide that these correspond or contribute to overfishing and overcapacity. And how do you define and describe those is, uh, is quite difficult. One option is to basically base it on geographical areas. So look at where the fishing is taking place. Is it distant water fishing beyond national jurisdiction and then you prohibit everything? Uh, is it in EZ? Is it in territorial waters? Uh, you can have disciplines that uh, uh, focus more on the type of fishing, target large-scale industrial fishing, and maybe exempt small-scale small artisanal. Uh, or you can have disciplines that uh, are based on the type of subsidies, you know, capital cost subsidies, operating costs, uh, construction, repair, fuel subsidies. Now, one of the big issues here is that when we start having these ex-ante descriptions, they will obviously be a need for defining some boundaries and probably exceptions, uh, uh, including special and differential treatment, and uh, how you uh, define those, uh, those boundaries. And particularly, uh, if you have special and differential treatment, do you condition the, the special and differential treatment to management conditionalities, conditionalities in, in terms of how the resources is, is being used? Let, let me just, to, to finish, focus on one particular case in, to, to illustrate this, uh, this point, which is the case of small and artisanal fisheries. As, as uh, Claire mentioned, uh, we know that um, Artisanal, small scale and artisanal account for a relatively small amount of subsidies, around 16%, with 84 going to large scale. And we also know that generally a higher proportion of beneficial subsidies go to, uh, uh, to small scale, like uh, almost half of uh, the subsidies that go to small scale are beneficial uh, uh, and only 28% for large scale. Uh, so there, there is, and then we know the importance of small scale for, for livelihood and so on and so forth. There might be a case for having some exemptions uh, for small-scale artisanal fisheries, but here again, our big problem is how do you define it? And countries are defining it very different ways. There is no internationally agreed definition. At most, one can use or think about some common feature that one can find in different, in different legislations, and that's what you have in the, in the, in the table on the, on the, on the right. Uh, but even then, there's a lack of consensus. Uh, FAO usually talks about uh, uh, lengths, for example, of uh, uh, 24 meters. Below that, it's small scale. Above, it's large scale. Uh, but in Canada, it's not uh, 24 meters. It's uh, 60 uh, or so. Uh, economic features, social feature, maybe geographical feature. Uh, these are some of the, the, the possible options. Finally, and let me conclude here, I think that uh, well, there is a unique opportunity to, 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 to contribute to the advancement of uh, uh, the, the WTO mandate, but also the SDG 14.6, and, and that will have in, in Buenos Aires. Uh, I think if we want an agreement, we need to acknowledge that this is not just a trade or an environmental issue. Uh, it is a food security, it is a livelihood uh, issue, it's a development uh, issue, and that has to be reflected in the, in the, in the outcome. Obviously, a multilateral outcome is a first best uh, solution, uh, but there has been, as you know, uh, proposals also for a plurilateral approach. Uh, at this stage, I would think that, you know, if one wants to go for a plurilateral approach, you would need at least to get a critical mass uh, of countries participating, and we're really far from it if we look at the current plurilateral approach, uh, with basically the members that are, are part only account for 21% of total amount of subsidies, 20% of world catches, 24% of world exports, so, so we're not there yet. Um, but finally, uh, and, and I think that's probably the most important point for Buenos Aires, uh, if we cannot have an, a consensus on all the elements on the table, let's at least get some kind of a core set of disciplines and, and see uh, as a first step and see if we, can, if we can continue over time as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christophe. Uh, I saw that some of you were taking photos of some of the slides. Uh, of course, uh, you're welcome to do so. Uh, and if you want to tweet them, I think there is no problem. Uh, but if you want them for the longer run, of course, uh, we can uh, make these, uh, these uh, slides available. And then maybe I should have mentioned also that uh, 
very quickly, uh, maybe only next week, but maybe earlier than next week, uh, this uh, uh, session uh, will be available on the ICT SD website in streaming. In other words, uh, this is being filmed, and so you smile, you'll be on TV, uh, and you can uh, you see the, the, the slides uh, on, on the ICT website in, in just a few days. So we've heard from the fish heads. Can I call you fish heads? <laughs> and now we'd like to hear from the trade heads, uh, their reactions and their, uh, their ambition, uh, their, uh, their uh, fears perhaps also, and also maybe their advice to uh, non-state actors who are trying to, to uh, help the uh, WTO to, uh, to reach, uh, to reach uh, um, an outcome. So uh, I uh, would like to propose that we start with uh, uh, Juan Carlos Gonzalez, who is the ambassador and permanent representative of Colombia uh, to the WTO. Uh, I think it's the first time the WTO uh, ministerial conference will uh, take place in South America. It has taken place in Central America a number of times, in Cancun and in Seattle, as we all remember, uh, but uh, in South America, never, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's, it's an opportunity, a great opportunity for South America to, to contribute and then we will continue with, uh, with David Walker, the ambassador uh, of New Zealand, and Mustakim uh, from South Africa should be here uh, momentarily. We saw him uh, before the session and he had to run somewhere, but we trust he'll arrive on time. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Remy. And Claire, for the invitation, I guess I would start uh, to, to mention that when you ask me, what are the sort of things that organizations such as yours could do to support the process? I think this is the sort of thing that you should be doing. Uh, this kind of engagement, this kind of information, the analysis, I think that, that all of that is very, very important. Even more so as we come uh, closer to, to a very important uh, uh, gathering, which will be the, the MC11, as it was uh, uh, mentioned uh, before. Um, I guess, uh, I, I was thinking that maybe David should have spoken first because he wrote his uh, PhD thesis on this matter, whereas for me it's fairly new. But at the same time, I think it also uh, it also uh, uh, forces me uh, to, to <laughs> always been something that I've seen as a very important issue that has been evolving really quickly in the last year since I arrived here. And definitely, I like what uh, what uh, the title of your uh, publication, The Low-Hanging Fish. Uh, we think that that's a very important message, and we, we hope that's the, the result that we're going to accomplish. Uh, let me please uh, refer to some ways or so, uh, in which uh, Colombia uh, has been approaching uh, this matter and why this is important to us, and also because to understand that every country is coming to this uh, from a different background. Um, so I guess, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the way Claire explained the importance of the issue is quite important to us. And at the same time, I think that Christophe made a very good presentation of the challenges ahead. In the case of Colombia, um, I would like to start by highlighting that uh, Colombia was a lead proponent of the SDGs within the UN system in Rio Plus 20 in 2012. So therefore, of course, we're fully committed with the, with, the, with the objectives, and we want to work on that, or we have been working very uh, closely on that. The SDGs were quickly incorporated in our national development plan. Uh, when you look at Colombia's development plan for 2014, 2018, 92 of the 169 goals were incorporated with, within the plan, and are carefully being followed up. Um, and of course, we think that uh, this is the place, the WTO, where the commitment regarding to, uh, to, uh, to fisheries subsidies should be addressed. At the national level, at the same time, uh, we have been uh, committed to initiatives such as the FAO FAO's um, Initiative on Preventing IUU, and uh, that has been also part of what has been uh, the national development in terms of developing a law, a law, a recent law of 2017, which uh, was set to prevent and to eliminate IUU fishing in Colombia's jurisdiction, jurisdictional waters. 
and it, of course it sets up all the all the all the ways that this should be uh, notified to other organizations and and, and involved organizations and also at the local level, uh, we have been strengthening our, our, our institutions. In 2011, Colombia set up the National Authority for Aquaculture and Fisheries. This has also been part of the, of the, of the initiatives that Colombia has been taking in terms of, uh, as you look at uh, uh, joining an organization such as the OECD, uh, Colombia has been already approved by 21 of 23 committees in the process, and one of them is the, is the, is the one regarding uh, fisheries. With regards to uh, Colombia, and the fisheries sector, there is uh, some uh, uh, figures that I would like to share with you. Whereas Colombia is the number 31 uh, economy in the world in terms of GDP, uh, real GDP. It is uh, 29 in numbers of population. It is only 81 in terms of uh, fishing uh, captures, and that includes also aqu aquaculture. It is only 0.17% of our GDP. And that's despite about the, about, despite the high potential that Colombia has uh, of, uh, of, uh, of being the South American country that has both uh, coast on the Pacific and the Atlantic and more than 3,000 kilometers of, uh, of coast. Uh, but at the same time, it is a sector that is very important <coughs> when it comes to the social needs and, and, and objectives of the country. It is, uh, it is calculated that about 1.5 million Colombians work in the sector or in related uh, services. And when you look at, uh, at uh, the importance that Colombia has the post-conflict, uh, as we have uh, entered a, a, a phase of post-conflict after the, uh, the peace uh, process, of course, uh, opportunities such as the one given by the fisheries sector are important for us to consider in the social development of the, of the country. Um, mm, at the same time, uh, linked to what uh, uh, Claire was saying, uh, we have seen the impact of uh, of overfishing in in uh, in our um, in this sector. It is estimated that over half of the species for which there is data available are under overfishing conditions in Colombia. And if you look at the captures, if you compare what was the the available uh, uh, data for 2013, it was about half of that in the 90s. Uh, and at the same time, we have a very small fleet. It is uh, calculated that Colombia only has 14 industrial vessels for such a, a great potential. So I guess one important concern or point that we have when we approach these discussions and uh, these negotiations is that, of course, members are not approaching this negotiation from the same point. Some countries or some members might be in a condition of overcapacity. In other cases, such as the case of Colombia, it is actually a situation of undercapacity. Um, so uh, in terms of what we have been doing here at the WTO, as it is mentioned in the, in the, in the, in the document and is, as, as it, is, uh, it is known, we have, uh, working, uh, we have been working uh, very closely with some other Latin American countries, Argentina, Costa Rica, Uruguay, Peru, and Panama, in the proposal that is actually analyzed there. It covers, uh, as you know, uh, broadly some characteristics about the, the, uh, the proposals. Uh, it covers all the objectives of the SDGs, the elimination of subsidies which uh, contribute to IOU, but also to prohibit certain subsidies that contribute to overcapacity as well as to overfishing. Um, it's been a, a proposal that has, uh, has been also uh, constructed uh, following a, a very uh, deep dialogue with other uh, delegations. Um, and some of the things that were mentioned uh, before are part of the, of the, of the proposal uh, in terms of transparency, Instead of in terms of providing SDT technical assistance and also uh, looking into specific uh, uh, issues uh, related to our capacity, not just in terms of, of, of new capacity, but also in bar of inputs, as Claire uh, mentioned, that it was important to, to take into account. So that's in a nutshell what we, where we come from and where we are here uh, within, the, 
within the negotiation. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, indeed, uh, the, the uh, document, uh, The Low Hanging Fish, uh, contains uh, uh, a description of the pos position of the Latin American countries uh, as well as the other groups. Uh, if you do not have a, a copy uh, for those who arrived late, we still have some copies here that we can uh, hand uh, to you at the end of this session. It's, of course, also online on the uh, Bloom uh, website. Um, uh, Colombia, of course, uh, you uh, have a special responsibility because you are really the the, the, I would say the mother, because of Paola Caballero, the mothers uh, of, uh, of the SDGs, uh, and we've been, uh, those of us who've been uh, participating in the discussions around uh, Rio plus 20 and beyond know the, uh, that really this is a, the SDGs are a, a baby uh, of, of uh, Colombia and, and Guatemala, uh, really, but what Colombia certainly has the... Uh, great part of the ownership. Uh, uh, David Walker, uh, New Zealand. Um, so I, I was not aware that you did your PhD on, the, on this <laughs> issue. So you're both a trade head and a fish head. Uh, so that's uh, one more reason why we're eager to, to hear from you. Uh, well, thank you, Remy, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for including New Zealand in this very important uh, initiative today. Uh, I hasten to add that that PhD was a very long time ago. It was in the 1980s. Uh, fisheries was a, a chapter case study in what was an entirely theoretical exercise on the economics of regulation. So it's far removed from the real politic that we are dealing with here <coughs> in, uh, in this process. Uh, for New Zealand, uh, like many countries, the fisheries sector is uh, very important to us, uh, both as an economic activity uh, and also as a part of our cultural fabric. Um, but we are also alarmed at the poor state of the world's fisheries, and that is why uh, we um, have been active over many years, uh, along with others, in promoting uh, fisheries subsidies reform here in the WTO and elsewhere. Um, it includes coordinating what's called the um, Friends of uh, Fish, um, which we can talk about low-hanging or not, but we are friends of uh, Fish Full Stock Group of like-minded WTO uh, members, as well as working in the APEC and uh, the OECD. Um, of course, our concern for the fish is not unique to us, uh, and we have many uh, colleagues who are uh, motivated by this issue and looking to pursue um, reform here in Geneva. Uh, you asked us to do uh, several things to share our experiences for MC11, to respond to the low-hanging fish report, uh, and to comment on what civil society might do um, to help at MC11, so I'll try and uh, cover those um, things. On the expectations for MC11, um, if you ask a professional negotiator what their expectations are, they'll be tempted to tell you that they are what they want. Um, but even putting aside our own position as a demandeur um, in the fisheries subsidies negotiations, um, I have every expectation that there will be some outcome on fisheries uh, subsidies at MC11. Uh, why do I say this? Well, pointing to the very fact of the SDGs, as you have said, um, they add uh, significant political importance to and support uh, for our work here in Geneva, um, as echoed most recently in the uh, June uh, Fisheries Ocean Summit. And target 14.6 uh, includes a very clear 2020 deadline. So that sets very uh, crucial context for us here in the WTO. Fisheries subsidies was discussed at MC10 in Nairobi, but uh, we didn't manage to agree an outcome. Uh, as the low-hanging... Uh, Fish Report says we've been working hard here since, and uh, not just since then, there have been many uh, years of work. So with the 2020 clock uh, ticking, um, we think that the excuse we need more time simply won't wash anymore. So uh, we think that the stage is set for an outcome that will um, uh, 
deliver to uh, the issue of, issue of harmful fishery subsidies in order to um, meet uh, SDG 14.6. Um, but what sort of an outcome uh, are we talking about? Again, um, uh, I'd be tempted to say, well, we're looking for an outcome which is consistent with the proposal that uh, New Zealand, Pakistan and Iceland uh, have proposed, which covers <coughs> the whole uh, of the SDG uh, target. <coughs> but this is a negotiation, uh, and there are uh, a number of other proposals also on the table, six to be precise, with differing approaches. Now, in one sense, that uh, adds to the expectation uh, for an outcome uh, at MC11, and uh, differences can actually help uh, provide negotiators with parameters and concepts to work with. <coughs> These proposals also come from the wide uh, spectrum of the membership, both big and small members and developed and developing uh, members. So I think that um, looking from the outside, you can take this as an illustration of the keen interest of members uh, in and the importance of this issue. There are a number of commonalities across these proposals as well. Most obviously, uh, we see in detail uh, and in principle prohibitions on subsidies where there is IUU fishing uh, and overfished stocks. That shouldn't be any surprise uh, because, um, as mentioned in the low-hanging fish report again, <coughs> these are activities that just sim simply shouldn't be occurring in any case, let alone be supported by government <coughs> funding. So that core, there's a lot of commonality around uh, that core. And a significant majority of WTO members are, are clearly supporting uh, prohibitions and also have articulated how those might translate into uh, WTO rules. <coughs> Clearly, though, <coughs> excuse me, IUU and overfished is not sufficient to implement uh, the SDG target. We also have the subsidies, as you have heard, for overfishing and overcapacity, and we need to address those more comprehensively. That brings me to uh, the low-hanging fish uh, report. My mind uh, boggled a little bit at the concept of low-hanging fish. I'm used to low-hanging fruit and trying to uh, reach for them. I did see some hanging fish in Iceland when I was recently there, um, but it, it wasn't very um, uh, appealing to look at. But I think the concept of low-hanging fish is something that we should try to work with. The report makes a very clear case that MC11 needs to deliver and it lays out a useful assessment of the proposals on the table. And it appoints to some of the uh, risks around the different approaches. That includes the risks of excessive exceptions from subsidy prohibitions, whether they be for all members or for developing <laughs> members. Experience of uh, other areas, such as you can see in the Agreement on Agriculture, and we see some similar concepts coming through from the presentations there, suggest that all manner of subsidy uh, programs can be established and reported under apparently well-meaning exceptions. So this is the stuff of the negotiation, um, what was being run through before, to focus on uh, what the disciplines look like, but to ensure that the exceptions do not uh, negate or undermine the rule. With only three years to go to 2020, uh, MC11 provides an opportunity to set a comprehensive and framework in place which allows governments three years uh, to implement. But it's possible we won't get all that way, uh, and that leads me to two points. <coughs> if MC11 is not to prohibit uh, all subsidies that are contributing to overfishing and overcapacity, we must at least ensure that we stop things getting worse. So if we're having a partial outcome at MC11, we think it should be accompanied by the standstill, which is contained in uh, Rio and then reinforced in 14.6. Uh, <coughs> Comment on the plurilateral was made. 
We don't see plurilateral as a substitute for multilateral outcomes, but we do see it as potentially a useful complement. Final point on uh, civil society and the role. I agree with uh, Juan Carlos that today's type of event is very important. I think it's also important to try and take today's type of discussion and focus and bring it back directly into capitals to um, be focusing attention there at the political level in capitals. We here in Geneva see more uh, delegates coming from capitals, which is an illustration of the seriousness, which I think all members are putting on this issue for uh, Buenos Aires. <coughs> and civil society's role, I think, is to um, keep us up to the mark through transparency and analysis to contribute to the outcome in Buenos Aires being as uh, good as it possibly can be as we set the way for any further work to be concluded for MC12. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, <coughs> Ambassador. Um, indeed, uh, I mean, we can only speak for uh, our respective organizations, Claire and, and myself, but we will be in uh, in Buenos Aires, and uh, we can, I think, also speak on behalf of ICTSD, which is uh, organizing, as always, their uh, symposium uh, in the parallel to, to the uh, ministerial conference, and we'll certainly do our best to, to contribute to a solid outcome. <coughs> so one of the uh, regions that uh, suffers the most of, uh, uh, of overfishing, and, and which is, uh, by and large, a, a victim of, uh, of a fishing is Africa, so uh, it, it, it was uh, uh, very important. Uh, it was a priority for us to make sure that uh, uh, there would be an African voice uh, uh, speaking uh, on this panel uh, before we uh, engage uh, with you. So Mostakim uh, De Gama from uh, the mission in, uh, of South Africa here, um, uh, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you, Remy. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, it's indeed uh, an honor and a pleasure to, to be on this panel. And, um, and of course, um, we all agree that an outcome on fish uh, is important, and specifically in, in context of 14.6. Uh, now, of course, as Remy has indicated, uh, I will speak a little bit about um, our expectations um, our concerns um, as they relate uh, to these expectations and essentially also um, uh, try to articulate uh, a perspective, uh, of course, from a developing country. Colombia already has, has done a good job uh, in respect <coughs> of this uh, uh, aspect. However, I think uh, being from the African continent, uh, we have uh, specific concerns and issues, and of course, uh, as, as part of, of the set of proposals, um, the ACP has, has tabled a proposal, as well as, uh, as the LDC group. Uh, now, given all of these um, aspects together, I think um, uh, we need to assess, uh, in terms of outcomes, um, where we are in the process before we can necessarily talk about uh, specific ambitions. Now, as you know, we have several proposals that have been discussed uh, intensively um, during the latter part of last year and, uh, of course, uh, during this year before the summer break. Uh, we currently still have several proposals on the table um, and we have an integrated matrix. So what does this tell us about the state of affairs? Well, it tells us that all of us have an interest to achieve um, an outcome at, uh, at MC11. Um, and it also tells us that we have many issues in common. So all of us would want uh, disciplines on overcapacity, overfishing, IUU specifically. Um, but all of this is to be contextualized uh, in respect of um, certain demands that are being made. For instance, um, the ACP proposal, of, of which we are a, a proponent, um, places a lot of emphasis on special and differential treatment. Uh, some 
uh, proposals do not necessarily treat uh, with uh, special and differential treatment. Um, and of course, many of the proposals, for instance, if one looks at the Latin group, tries to integrate special and differential uh, treatment as part and parcel of, um, of the substantive disciplines. However, ultimately, um, the ACP has gone um, on the basis that uh, special and differential treatment is a mandated outcome, and, and as a result, um, strong emphasis needs to, be, um, needs to be placed on this uh, specific aspect. Given this fact further, I would think that if uh, one looks at uh, the various proposals, and, and of course the, um, the excellent paper, the, the low-hanging fish, a question that we may have is not necessarily that there are low-hanging fish, but which fish in particular are low-hanging. That is to say, uh, is, uh, is it possible uh, to start to differentiate in terms of outcomes? Now, we have uh, some sort of uh, external mandate under 14.6, but we should also realize that within the organization, we have a mandate under DOA. We also understand that under Nairobi, uh, certain members have agreed to disagree on specifically the integrity of that, uh, of that mandate, but the process that has been conducted has been conducted within the negotiating framework, within the NGR, and is entirely consistent with that particular mandate. Now, now given this fact, and, and given the fact that all of us agree on what areas um, could be a possible outcome. I think the, the devil is in the detail. Even if we agree that there are low-hanging fish, we have to agree uh, to, um, to what effect we could, um, we could have a consensus view on all of these things. Now, one of the difficulties that we see in these proposals is, or at least would be, that the WTO is called upon to make determinations on matters that do not necessarily relate to its trade mandate. And as a result, one finds oneself in an international conundrum where other organizations that have more specific mandates have either um, failed to, um, to reach agreement on many seminal issues that are central to the discussions that we're having, but more importantly, have left to the discretion of national members how they achieve these outcomes. Now, of course, um, one of the issues that, that is addressed in, in the low-hanging um, fish paper is on uh, so-called overfished or overfished condition. Um, MSY is, is one option. The other is, is best scientific evidence available. Now, if one looks at the various proposals, all of us reference this particular standard in one way or another. But I think the relevant standard, given the fact that there is no consensus on the methodologies in relation to um, how these uh, various levels are, are assessed, is really to the difference of what happens at a national level. And so, if we have best available science available, it should reference the member because it is only the member that is able to, um, to, to act on, on evidence that is available to itself. Um, of course, there's also other uh, issues that I think uh, dominate discussions and, and this is on uh, a de facto uh, presumption on overfished condition, on burden of proof, um, and, and really, if, if one were to assume that a certain um, stock is in, in an overfished condition, what methodology does one use? Um, who decides on um, what uh, uh, these parameters are? And of course, um, you know, one has to really um, contextualize this discussion within the parameters that we are. The WTO is just not in a position to assess um, what these particular aspects would be. On, um, on, on overcapacity, we are having a very interesting discussion uh, whether or not 
the discipline should be broadly applied to include both capital uh, and variable cost or operating cost, or um, whether it should be more disaggregated. Even in this respect, we have, um, we have proponents uh, agreeing that this should form part of the, of the outcome, but ultimately, which of these should be included or out, uh, excluded um, would, would necessarily be a question. Um, on geographic scope, it's precisely the same. Uh, for instance, the ACP agrees that there should be disciplines on overcapacity, overfishing, IUU fishing, but um, it is a question of also policy space. Um, where do these disciplines apply and to what extent do they apply to so-called small-scale um, artisanal fishing disciplines? Uh, this is also still a question that we yet have to get um, to, to the bottom of. Uh, in respect of uh, transparency, of course, we've also indicated that um, um, outcomes should be at least uh, proportional to the capacity of, um, of countries to comply with these notification requirements. And I think with, with good effect, uh, one of the proposals in, in the low-hanging fish uh, paper is that we look at, at compulsory and a voluntary uh, aspects of notification. And I think this is something that we could usefully um, look into. So uh, in summary, um, where are we and, and, and what should we uh, take into account as we move forward? I think as, the, as, as David indicated, we are out of time. We do not have the luxury of saying, well, you know, we have two years, we have three years. We have virtually no time to agree on how to move forward. And so given the various scenarios that have been already put out by, by several of the speakers, uh, we would have to be realistic in um, very soon deciding what we want out of this process. So the moment of reckoning for us has arrived. There is no delay in deciding whether or not we could have a full outcome. Uh, if we cannot have a full outcome, what are the partial outcomes and uh, to what extent would we have a text ready that reflects all of this? Um, the process currently is proponent driven. When does the members or when do the members actually take um, ownership of this process? And, and so this is another open question uh, that would have to be settled in, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, uh, point of view coming from Africa and this reality check. Uh, of course, uh, it has been pointed out uh, uh, throughout this session that uh, uh, the bulk of uh, fishery subsidies go to the big guys and not uh, so much to the small guys, if you allow me this expression. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, uh, the uh, issue of uh, of uh, special and differential uh, treatment is, is relevant in that context. Um, also, uh, if, before I, I, I give the, the floor to the, to the, the room, um, we uh, believe, and that was discussed last week at the ICTSD uh, uh, session, um, we believe that uh, there is at the moment a special and differential treatment. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's a special and differential treatment that benefits the big guys. Uh, and if we maintain the status quo, uh, the big guys will, will uh, continue to benefit, and they'll benefit uh, what we could call a, a special and differential treatment. So uh, from the point of view of, of, of the developing countries, we would... Uh, we would argue that the status quo is not an option. Um, so uh, now we have uh, uh, some 20 minutes uh, for uh, questions and answers. We are delighted to see a full room here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, maybe we, uh, w when you call for questions from the floor, you never know quite what to expect. So uh, number one rule, please introduce yourself. And uh, maybe we'll see how that works, but maybe we'll try to take uh, uh, two or three uh, questions at, at a time 
uh, if you uh, indeed uh, would like to either ask for clarification or argue argue your own point of view or or ask questions to to any of the panelists uh, so does someone want uh, to shoot first or uh, does uh, any panelist uh, uh, wish to uh, uh, comment or respond to what uh, they've heard madam um thank you very much um my name is sunanta kangwan kunkit um ambassador and permanent representative of thailand from the mission of thailand to the wto um actually um i have uh, some kind of a uh, question uh, regarding the um the notion mentioned by uh, mr bellman because uh, i think that um the time is um the time is um, very, very limited for us uh, before MZ11. And um, um, you mentioned that um, the, the best is that uh, we have some kind of uh, the discipline on the uh, fishery subsidy. But then you mentioned that um, if it's not possible, the cost set of discipline uh, should, be, um, should be agreed uh, at the MZ11. Um, I, I just would like to... Um, to seek uh, more clarification of what is the, um, the core set of discipline that you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, this is a question that is directly uh, uh, directed at, at Christophe, but maybe before uh, Christophe uh, answers, maybe uh, uh, there is a gentleman here who has raised his finger. Thank you very much. I'm Pablo Agustin Escobar from the Mission of Ecuador. My question is also for Christophe Bellman. I think in your presentation you made an explicit reference to beneficial subsidies. I was wondering under what criteria or parameters would you consider a set of subsidies as beneficial in the context of the fisheries negotiation discussion? Thank you. That's a, an important question. That's also a concept that was uh, mentioned by Claire in, in her presentation. So we'll see uh, uh, how they want to, to handle it. Did you raise your hand? No? Um, so maybe, uh, Christophe, you would like to uh, uh, comment on, the, on the, the question raised by the ambassador of Thailand. Uh, yes, um, thank you, thank you, Remy. Um, maybe I'll start with the second question, which is the easy, <laughs> the easy one, <laughs> and then I'll come to to, to Tyler. On, on the first, uh, on the first, uh, the second question, the beneficial subsidies. This is related to um, some of the figures that I've uh, have shown, and and those figures are uh, basically based on the the work that has been done by. Um, the University of British Columbia, and what they have done is basically classified fishery subsidies in different groups, uh, calling them, some of them beneficials, and uh, others uh, uh, would be a capacity enhancing, and others whose uh, um, impact is, is more uh, ambiguous. So under the beneficial subsidies, what they essentially include is um, subsidies for the, the management of the resource. Uh, so uh, all support that is being provided to do stock assessments, monitoring, uh, preservation of the of the of the resources uh, would fall under that uh, that category. So subsidies that supposedly would not have an effect on enhancing capacity. Um, on the 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 point uh, made by uh, the ambassador from 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 Thailand. Um, I guess that's really the key question. No, what would be a core set of disciplines uh, which uh, would, uh, you know, form a kind of minimum type of outcome that would be uh, acceptable and on which one would uh, would build in the future? I think. I think there's a broad recognition that uh, we will not be able to have an agreement that covers everything uh, and that will not be possible and, and therefore that uh, uh, one would have at some point to, to, to prioritize a certain set of disciplines. 
What would that include? Uh, I guess really depends on 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 on, on the members. But uh, but I would I would imagine that uh, uh, issues where there seems to be at least some level of convergence, and and we've heard that uh, in areas such as IUU fisheries. Uh, uh, IUU subsidies in, in the area of uh, overfish stocks, there seems to be relatively uh, uh, close views, uh, uh, and some elements of uh, f uh, subsidies that contribute to overfishing and overcapacity. What, what exactly, I think, it's, it's probably the most difficult question that, that we have now at this stage. Uh, but uh, and then of course you can add you know some some disciplines in terms of transparency and and and, and so on and so forth. Um, but again, it, it's really up to the to the delegates to 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 to, to set that <laughs> that limit in terms of what is both feasible and as I said at the beginning, uh, that we have sufficient scope so that uh, uh, we think that it's it's a worth uh, worthwhile uh, exercise. Thank you, uh, Claire. Would you like to add sure. something? And, but before you do, I'd like to just to recall, however, uh, in complement to, to what Christophe uh, has said, that there is a common uh, uh, policy of all of your governments, which a, a policy that has been adopted by consensus or unanimity just exactly this week uh, that was two years ago and that's what is uh, stated in SDG 14.6 so uh, we must not lose sight of uh, of this uh, mandate that has been given by your uh, respective heads of state and government uh, two years ago and the, and the target date is 2020. Yes, just to compliment very quickly, but I think it's been very interesting. I mean, since I was here in 2008, I talk about fishery subsidies at the WTO, and so time has flown, and uh, the debate is progressing. It's really nice to see it's picking up. But in the meantime, what's also happened is that scholars have really looked at the science of fishery subsidies and have really refined their understanding of what's going on with uh, the financial expenditures to the fishing sector. So in the meantime, of course, there is a leadership from the University of British Columbia, in that you know, understanding of uh, fisheries economics and uh, fishery subsidies. Um, the OECD has been doing a lot of work on that. And there's a, a very sort of groundworks paper called The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, which was really ca categorizing the good subsidies, the bad subsidies, and the ugly ones. And the ugly ones were ambiguous subsidies in the mind of scholars because they, were, they could lead to some progress for sustainable activities and sustained you know, environment, but they could also lead to some strange uh, actions. And buyback programs were typically in that category where you would spend public money to buy back some fishing effort, and that could actually, on, on the other hand, maybe the fishers could actually you know, get some other funding to develop more fishing effort in, on, on the other hand. So I think um, we have also a briefing, which I'm pointing to, which is called Time to Get the Math Right which is online and we'll send it. We have a newsletter that we started, the fishery subsidies newsletter. Um, we'll probably um, point to it again because we have uh, categorized those uh, good, bad, and ugly subsidies uh, to make it clear because at least now we can count on science to clarify and the expertise is out there to guide your steps in these, uh, in these negotiations. Thank you, Claire. Does uh, any... Uh representative of, uh, of, of the members wish to uh, talk to these uh, questions that were raised? Uh, David? Uh, well, just I think to, to reinforce a couple of those points. I mean, um, fully take the point, uh, South African colleague says here, that um, we're, not, we're not trying to turn the WTO into an organization that is not competent to deal with, so not a fisheries management organization, not, not scientific assessment, all those sorts of things, but um, firmly agree with the point that uh, about the SDG, as I was looking to articulate. Um, uh, we, um, and everybody, I think, um, has one, one leader, uh, and the leader signs up to something and then they expect it to get done uh, across the relevant parts of the system that can do it in cooperation with other parts of the system. And I think that role for the WTO was again reinforced from the Oceans Conference. 
the reason I'm pointing to the fact that the clock is ticking is because there are three years to get this done. So whatever we do this year, <coughs> we can implement over three years. Uh, whatever we leave to MC12, which is in another two years' time, we have crash cold turkey one-year implementation from everybody. So that's, that's I think, another bit of the mindset that, um, that people need to carry into this. We, we uh, look clearly at the point about the special and differential treatment in the S SDG, <coughs> but also, on the other side, uh, the fish don't care who's catching them, right? So, um, going back to what I was saying up front, it's very important that when we're talking about uh, development opportunities, policy space, that we also have a sustainability concept in mind, so those development opportunities are, are truly uh, sustainable. In our own uh, proposal, we haven't uh, looked to uh, put S&D in relation to IUU or overfished. Uh, because as I was saying, we think you know, that just shouldn't be happening, but going down further down the spectrum, clearly there's a space for properly designed uh, s and in, in the full uh, comprehensive mandate. Thank you, uh, David. You said there are three years to ahead, uh, but an, there is an argument that uh, says that there are only two years because the language of SDG uh, 14.6 uh, says by 2020. So uh, I don't think it, some will argue that uh, it doesn't mean by 31st December 2020, but may, rather by 1st January uh, 2020, uh, perhaps. And that, that was why I was saying cold turkey, because MC12 presumably will be at the end of 2019, uh, right on the time of implementation. Absolutely. And we hope that uh, it will be uh, an occasion to celebrate uh, that what you decide in uh, Buenos Aires uh, has largely been put in place by, by then. We have uh, an, another 10 minutes if we wish. Uh, is there any other uh, question that uh, you would like to raise? So I see a couple of hands. Uh, I saw you first you're, because you're closer to me and there was a gentleman at the other end of the room. So um, maybe to be fair, we'll ask the gentleman at the end of the, of the room and then you'll be next, sir. And please uh, introduce yourself. Mario Mantilla, representante del Congreso peruano. Eh, He escuchado atentamente la exposición de la señora Clay y creo que es bastante enfática en señalar de que los, las subvenciones fomentan la sobreexplotación. Esta es la primera vez que vengo a este tipo de eventos, no sé cómo habrán tratado en anteriores reuniones. Eh, conozco bastante cerca el sector pesquero artesanal porque provengo de una región donde, que vive de la pesca artesanal y que hace unos 10 años atrás habían aproximadamente un promedio de 200 pescadores artesanales y hoy son más de 2.800. Es decir, en la zona sur del Perú existe una migración de la, de la parte altandina hacia la costa y el primer, la, la primera fuente laboral que buscan es justamente la pesca artesanal. Entonces, desalentar, digamos, la subvención, no sé, es mi punto de vista personal, significaría en todo caso desplazar a pescadores auténticamente artesanales que no cuentan con muchos recursos, pero por otro lado, por lo menos en el sur peruano donde yo, de donde yo provengo, existen otros, eh, otros ciudadanos que trabajan en empresas donde reciben muy buenos ingresos que se dedican a invertir también en embarcaciones artesanales. Es decir, si con las subvenciones se pretende, digamos, reducir eh, de repente desalentar la, la pesca artesanal en, en pescadores de, poca, de pocos recursos económicos, sin embargo, van a haber otros sectores económicos, otros, otros ciudadanos con mayores recursos que van a invertir en esa actividad, porque por lo menos en la zona sur del Perú existe cierta, eh, ¿qué le digo? cierta rentabilidad de dedicarse a esta actividad. No sé si en otras oportunidades hayan tratado, por ejemplo, que de repente las vedas puedan ser mejor controladas, en el Perú, eh, lamentablemente, no existe una, una adecuada eh, vigilancia marítima como para este, 
eh, decomisar o de repente sancionar a, a pescadores que, que capturan productos hidrobiológicos por debajo de las tallas mínimas. Eh, hablamos también de, por ejemplo, de la vigilancia, control, eh, de repente también socializar el tema en, la, en los pescadores para que de alguna manera respeten las vedas y las tallas mínimas. Esa pregunta se la, eh, o esa, esa idea se la, se la propongo a la señora Clay. Muchas gracias uh, por su aporte, Claire. Uh, con, uh, puede contestar, pero primero tenemos uh, uh, otro interlocutor y, 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 y seguiremos. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jürgen Knirsch. I work for Greenpeace. And we are here at the center of the rule making for multilateral trade rules. At the same time, we have a tendency that a lot of countries are doing bilaterals or regional trade negotiations. So if I'm looking on the European Union, I can say well, there will be soon free trade re negotiations with New Zealand. There's an existing agreement with Vietnam. There is one with Japan, with, which it should be concluded this year. So my question is, if this process, beside the WTO, on bilateral or regional free trade agreements helpful for your issue or the opposite? Thank you. Thank you. I guess this is a, a question that maybe uh, some member will, will want to, to address or, or maybe Christoph. But uh, let's start with the, uh, with, with, with the question from, uh, from Peru. We have very little uh, Time yet? I just would like to, before Claire uh, uh, addresses the questions, I would like to to clarify that issues that have been raised by the the gentleman from from Peru, such as uh, vigilancia, uh, monitoring, uh, control, uh, and, and so forth, uh, are to a one mind uh, what f the kind of thing that falls in the category of. Of, uh, of what we call positive subsidies, but uh, uh, maybe uh, Claire would like to, to expand. Sure, thank you for your question. Um, my understanding of uh, small-scale fleets is that um, the field reality of small-scale fishers is that they are not um, globally, politically organized to go get the subsidies. So that's why they don't get them, because only 16% of uh, subsidies globally, the global data is such that that's why small-scale fishers do not get subsidies, whereas 80% or over um, percent of subsidies are actually uh, allocated to large-scale operators and fishers. So um, if we want to help small-scale fisheries, that's where we need to think and incorporate in our vision that we, there are winners and losers with subsidy programs. And so we, if we want, and that becomes uh, not so much a WTO discipline, because what the WTO should be doing is to design programs which ensure there are fish in the water at the end of the day, so that you have a fishing you know, economy that can develop. But really, whether you want to design programs that help one category versus another is really a very national domestic decision. You may have a vision that it's better to have a few operators that are very easy to, to monitor and control, and, and you can have CCTV on board, observers, and that doesn't cost too much. That's a choice. If you want jobs, if you want resilience of your territory, if you want the maximum benefits to, uh, to people, if you want to have stable you know, uh, socioeconomic um, patterns, then you really want to try to increase uh, small-scale fishers and income going to these people. So I don't think really, um, for sure, I, I heard, I'm not sure um, I caught the tr translation on time, but for sure the disciplines should not and will probably not be designed to discourage small-scale fishermen, but rather the opposite, to make sure that it's, it's becoming more or less in the longer run on par, at least with the large-scale fishers, because uh, the decisions which have been made so far, and that's where when the OECD says that national governments are stuck with some of their subsidy programs and maybe an outside constraint like a WTO discipline will help them find the courage to actually reform policies which do not benefit 
workers uh, in their own country. That's what we see, you know, the WTO could be, um, you know, providing a great excuse for national reforms. Thank you, uh, Claire. I hope that uh, the gentleman from Peru is uh, satisfied with this clarification. Uh, as you have noticed, when we just before we started this, uh, this session, we s virtually stormed into the previous one that was going a bit uh, too long. So I am mindful that we finish sharp at 5 o'clock so that the next ones uh, do not storm into, in, into our session. I'm wondering whether someone, but extremely briefly in that case, would like to talk to what uh, Greenpeace has been saying, uh, David, and, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, ultimately, whether such initiatives are useful or not gets decided here, but I think it is useful if people are engaged in those sorts of initiatives, bilateral and plurilateral, with a mind to try to help. Uh, before here, I was involved in the Trans-Pacific Partnership in the Asia-Pacific, and one of the communication points when I was taking the outcome around New Zealand was that precisely the TPP was the first agreement to try to set some rules in this area, some rules that we thought might help in the Asia-Pacific across a broad range of big, small, develop, developing, but also as we were envisaging them, we, uh, and I'm sure it's true for our other partners, thought that we could then take that to broader fora such as here and say, here is an example, if it helps, that's great. So I think if others are doing that in, in their region, in their agreements, that is a, a useful contribution to the broader debate. Thank you, uh, David. I would like to propose now that uh, Claire, who is one of the co-organizers, or Bloom is one of the co-organizers of this session, says very, you have just a few seconds uh, to uh, conclude uh, on the behalf of uh, all of us. If the other panelists are happy with uh, this way to... Okay, so very quickly, just a word of caution to all of you who represent nations to not let the fishing industry sweet talk you into an escalade of uh, fishing capacity between now and some implementation. We've seen it in the past. We're talking about a deep sea bottom troll ban in Europe, and we're talking about closures of areas. The fishing industry heard about the fact that we're going to close areas because they had magnificent corals. They went out there and they wiped the place, place clean of anything that was still alive. So please don't let that happen just because we're talking. And of course, we really recommend that you stick to the SDG target and your mandate to incorporate overfishing and overcapacity as well as IU fishing, as well as transparency. And please get started. If you can't do the proper job in, in the, you know, within three months, at least get started without loopholes. And good luck. And we'll be here to help you. And thank you. Thank you. And you can see on this photo that was taken in New York exactly two years ago that uh, you, we have all agreed to get the job done and let's get it done in Buenos Aires. Thank you.